Well, today is, is certainly an exciting day for us as, as a church family as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And again, we, we want to thank so many of you for coming out to celebrate this with us. But the one thing that was pointed out this morning is that we're not just celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, but we're also celebrating everything that the birth of Jesus Christ represents. And so that means that we're celebrating the fact that the Son of God would come to earth, that he would be conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, that he would take upon himself human flesh, that he would be born as a child. We celebrate the fact that through this baby, that the way of salvation is opened up to so, so many. And when we think about a world where there's so much brokenness, where we experience so much tragedy, and we see so much hurt, and we feel grief in our own lives, and we see it in the lives of those around us, well, then the birth of Jesus Christ stands out for us as a, as a beacon of, of hope. It stands there as something for us to hold on to, and it gives us a, a reason, we've said, to rejoice. But we, we recognize at the same time that not everybody in the world reacts to the birth of Jesus Christ the same way. We, we understand that, and one of the interesting things about the Christmas season is that you actually kind of see the different ways that people respond to Jesus. We have people who love the Christmas season, and I think you, you know these people that I'm talking about. They love everything about Christmas. They love the lights, they love the presents, they love the malls, they love the displays, they love everything about Christmas. But they deny the significance of the birth of Jesus Christ. And, and we have other people who, who, who love Christmas, but they really don't love Christ at all. We know people who, who are actually hostile to Jesus Christ. People who are very intentional about wanting to take anything that, that, that ties Christ to Christmas, they want to remove that. And then there are others, and I pray that there are many of those people here tonight for whom the only thing that matters about Christmas is Christ. People who could forego all the hype and all the presents and all the rest of it if they could just celebrate Jesus Christ. But I think the interesting thing that we discover in our passage today as we reflect on it is, is that these different reactions to the birth of Jesus Christ, these are reactions that have always happened. This is the way that people have responded differently to the news of Jesus ever since the birth of Jesus occurred. And so I want to look tonight kind of briefly at this passage so that we can hopefully all make it home. Um, we're going to look at this and I want to point out just three things. Three different ways that people react to the birth of Jesus. And we're going to see that some people will seek him, that some people will deny him, and that some people will also be hostile to him. And the underlying question that I want to put before you tonight is where do you, where do you fall in that spectrum? And I want to ask you to prayerfully look at your hearts and ask yourself, what, what is your reaction to the birth of Jesus Christ, to what we're celebrating today? Are you among those who, who seek him? Those who seek him are, are represented in this story by a group called the Magi, the wise men. And you're probably familiar with the wise men to one degree or another. I mean, we, we, we sing about them. We have them in these carols. They're, they're part of the nativity scene here. But I, I want to spend just a bit of time talking about actually a, a bit about who they were to give a little bit of context. Now, the truth is that there's a lot of legend, there's a lot of tradition that's been passed down about the, the Magi, about these three wise men, about who they were. But we don't know exactly who these individuals were. We do know, we do know based on the term Magi, we know that they were a, a group that was among the wise men of the Medes and, and the Persians and the Babylonians. And so you have to understand that as wise men, these were people of status. These were people who had at least a significant role. They were important characters. They were people who would have had influence. They would have been people of, of clout, you could say. They were recognized broadly for their wisdom. They were recognized for the fact that they understood the sciences. They understood things like astrology. They were looked to as interpreters of dreams. And so these were, these were important figures. Now again, tradition tells us that there were three of them. And I hate to be the one that ruins all the Christmas carols for you, but we just don't know. We just don't know how many there were. 
I think the fact that when we look at the story and we see that Herod and all Jerusalem, verse 3, that all of them were disturbed by the arrival suggests that it was probably a larger group. Maybe there were three wise men, but certainly they, they seem to have come maybe as an entourage, as a, as a caravan. They came as a group of people. And they came from actually quite a distance. And if we can pull up a map, I can just mention a couple of things about this. We know again from the term Magi that they were among uh, the Medes, the Persians, the Babylonians, those who occupied that territory. And that would put them probably somewhere in the area of, of modern-day Iraq or Iran. And if they were to have followed the conventional routes, the trade routes of the day, to Jerusalem, it, they'd probably have taken a trek of some 1,500 kilometers, give or, or take a little bit. And so they, they undertake a significant, significant journey. And they come, we're told, because they've seen this star in the east. And we don't know exactly why, but they are convinced that this star is significant, that this star actually represents the birth of the king of the Jews. And so they come, and, and, and they come here to search, so they come to worship the king of the Jews. And obviously it makes sense that if you're going to come and you're going to search for the king of the Jews, a pretty good spot to start looking would be Jerusalem, because it's kinda, it, it was like the heart of the Jewish nation. And, and so they come to Jerusalem. And I think the fact, we need to understand that, that the fact that they even have an understanding of the, the Jewish tradition suggests that they are at least familiar with Jewish scriptures. And it's possible that somehow they, they are descendants uh, of the Jews, maybe in the same way that someone like Daniel from the story of Daniel and the lion's den was. They seem to be familiar with the idea that the Jews were promised a Messiah, that they were promised a ruler, that there was a king that was coming. And you could think there's a, there's a passage from Numbers 24, verse 17, which talks about a star that will rise out of Judah, about a king that will rise up. And so perhaps that's what they're thinking of when they see this star. And we don't know what the star looked like. Don't know if it was a comet, don't know if it was... A particularly unique constellation all we know is that God in some amazing supernatural way he opened their eyes to the birth of the king and he opened their eyes and he led them to Jesus Christ now I want to stop for a second just to reflect on these magi I think I think when we look at their response to the revelation that they received from God I think there's there's an important lesson that we can actually learn for our own lives and that is that we need to be willing to leave things behind if we want to meet the king. We need to be willing to leave things behind if we want to meet the king. These guys, we forget, they, they had good lives. Right? They, they, they had important positions. Maybe they served in the royal courts. These were people that others looked up to. They had solid jobs, you could say. They had life on track. They had good things happening in their lives. And yet that did not hold them back from seeking Jesus. I mean, these, these were people that had every reason to stay. And yet when they were convinced that the king of kings had been born, they left everything behind to pursue him. And they endured the hardship. They endured the journey that was ahead. Right? I easily pull up a map and I show you kind of what this would look like. They had no idea what the road ahead was going to look like. They didn't know how far that journey was going to take. They didn't know exactly what was all going to happen. But they knew that if they could meet, if they could have an encounter with the King of Kings, then it would all be worth it. And you know, God is still revealing himself even in this place tonight. And he's not doing it in the form of the star but God reveals himself simply in the truth of his word. And the truth of God's word revealed as we have it in front of us. God tells us about the birth of the king of kings. And if you open up the word of God, you see not just the promises of the Messiah, the promises that maybe the Magi that they saw, but we can read about the entire life of Jesus Christ. We can read about the reality, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension. We can learn about who Jesus, the King of Kings, was, and we can learn about everything that he represents. 
right here as God has revealed in his word. Now, I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe you come here as someone who, humanly speaking, has a lot of what life seems to offer. Maybe you come here as someone who, humanly speaking, people look at you and they say, you have a good job and you have, you have good income and you have relationships, maybe a boyfriend, a girlfriend, friends. And yet you don't have the one thing that matters most. Well, I want to ask you then, what is it that's holding you back from seeking Jesus Christ? And I want to encourage you just to leave that behind. Just to leave that behind. I mean, you don't know what the road ahead is going to look like, and you don't know exactly what's going to lie in front of you as you seek to follow Jesus. But the one thing that you do know is that God will lead the way. And there will be hard times. It's not always easy as you seek to follow Jesus Christ. There will be days where you might look at it and say, well, it seemed like it would be easier just to stay where things were comfortable just to stay where I was. But the truth is that if you're not willing to leave things behind, then you will not meet the king. And an encounter with Jesus Christ is worth giving up everything for. But we recognize that not everybody is going to respond to Jesus Christ that way. And even in this passage, we see two other types of reactions. We see two different reactions. We see those who who kind of deny the truth of Jesus Christ, and also those who are hostile. So as we, as we get back to the passage, we discover that, that these magi, they've come to Jerusalem, and the whole city seems to be kind of talking about them. They, they, they've disturbed, they've caused at least an awareness in the city. And King Herod, he, he looks at these, these wise men, and he thinks about the fact that they've come all the way from where they were here to seek the king of the Jews and he figures at least that it's worth kind of looking into this a little bit. And so what he does is he calls together, we're told, the chief priests, and he calls together the teachers of the law. And if the, if the magi, if they were considered to be the wise men from the east, then these guys that Herod is calling together, these, these are like the wise men from among the Jews. Right? These, are, these are like the local wise men. These are, are religious leaders, particularly when it comes to things like the, the Messiah and the promise of a coming king. These, these are the guys who are experts in understanding the scripture. And so what he does is he calls them together and he asks them, you know, where is the one who's going to be born who's king of the Jews? And they, to find an answer, they, they turn to the word of God, which for the record is always a good principle to follow. So they turn to the word of God and, and, and they look to the prophecy of Micah. And they read there, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So these, these wise men, they, they, they look at the scriptures and they say the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ, it's going to happen in Bethlehem. That's where, that's where the king is going to be born. That's where we should look to. And that's ultimately, I guess, where, where the magi, where they should be headed as well. When it comes to the scriptures, when it comes to the knowledge about where the king is going to be born, these guys are solid, right? They understand the truth. But here's the problem. By their actions, they deny the truth, right? They're solid on the scriptures. They knew the truth. They knew where the king was going to be born, but they didn't do anything with it. And the fact is that if you, if you know the truth about Jesus Christ, but if you're not actually doing anything with the truth of Jesus Christ, then ultimately what you end up doing is you just deny the significance of Jesus Christ. You, you end up denying the significance of the king of kings. And so you have these, these wise men who are there that come from the east, and you have to think about this. Here are these guys who have left everything behind in order to come all this way to find the king of the Jews. And you've got these Jewish wise men who should be the ones looking forward to the coming of this king. And they discover that he's going to be born in Bethlehem and they don't do anything with it. We don't get the impression that they say, let's pack our bags. Right? We don't get the impression that they say, hey, let's get our stuff together. They don't go to the Magi and say, hey, can we catch a ride? Can we? Right? They don't do anything 
with the news of Jesus Christ. And so they end up really denying the truth and the significance of Jesus Christ. And I want to suggest that that's a warning for us tonight. There is a big difference between knowing about Jesus Christ and actually seeking Jesus Christ. The truth is that you can be here and you can love everything about this. You can love the Christmas carols and you can love the kind of the festive season. You can love Christmas. You can love the Christmas story. There's a lot of good stuff. But if you're not actively seeking Jesus Christ in your life, then ultimately what you end up doing is, is, is you just end up denying the truth. Then your reaction is not that much different than the chief priests and these teachers of the law. They know about the king, but they're not actually moved to action by the king. Well, there's one last character, and that's Herod. And Herod, we read, that he, he pulls these magi together, and he's, he pretends like he's interested in the birth of the king. Right? He pulls them together secretly. He wants to have a conversation with them. He gives the impression that he wants to worship the king, but if you know the larger story, you know that he's not at all interested in worshiping the king. In fact, Herod is hostile to the news of the king, and he's hostile to the news ultimately of Jesus. And this is an attitude that you see uh, among the world today. This is an attitude that we see in our, in our city, we see in this country as well. People who are not just about denying the truth of Jesus Christ, but people who, who, are, who are actually hostile to the truth of Jesus. And Herod, he's hostile because he feels that his kingship is going to be threatened. Right? Herod feels that his position might be in jeopardy, and he's got a pretty good gig going on. Like, he does answer to someone. He answers he's been put in place by Rome. But overall, he's got a lot of freedom. He's got a lot of liberty. He gets to do what he wants. People look up to him. People respect him. But he understands that if this new king is actually real, if there is a new king in town, then the reality is that he might be removed from his position. And the reality is that Herod might actually become second. And Herod hates that idea. He hates the idea that he might have to answer to someone else. And I think that the reason many people today are hostile towards the birth of Jesus Christ and hostile towards the news of King Jesus is because of the fact that by implication it means that we will need to be removed from our thrones. And we, we as people, we like to do what we want, and we like to call the shots, and, and we like the idea of kind of having a, a sense of authority, but if Jesus Christ is who the Word of God reveals him to be, then, then he must be first, and we must be second. There's no alternative to that. If Jesus is who the Word of God claims him to be, then he must be first, and we must be second. And most of you, I don't know if you're like me at all, we don't like being second. That's the truth. I mean, we fight against that, but we, we resist being second. We like to be in charge. And the Word of God is all about submitting ourselves to the birth and to the life of King Jesus. One of the great ironies is that sometimes those who are hostile don't realize that they're being hostile towards a king who wants to love them and who wants to show them compassion and who wants to show them grace, and who wants to show them mercy. Jesus Christ as a king, he's all about loving his people more than himself. Jesus Christ as a king, he's all about putting his people first and putting himself second. The entire Christmas story is about Jesus Christ coming to earth and being born so that he could give his life for your life. The very character of Christ the King is all about the fact that he's not based on lies, but he's based on truth. And he's not based on ruthlessness and callousness and coldness, but he's about grace and compassion and mercy, even to those who are hostile to him and even to those who deny him. Jesus Christ is not someone who comes by pride, but he's someone who comes with humility. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of king that that we should want to serve. That's the kind of king that you want to lay your life before. And so again, I want to ask you, what is your reaction to the birth of Jesus? 
Jesus says in Matthew 7, he says, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Our prayer for you as a church today is that you would seek and that you would find like the Magi. You know, the truth is that it doesn't matter how far apart you are from God today. It doesn't matter how far you are from God today. If you entrust yourself to him and if you look to him and if you follow where he is leading, he will lead you to Jesus Christ. And then you will find Jesus Christ and you will have the reaction that everybody has when they find Jesus Christ. And that is one of joy. They're overjoyed like the Magi. That is one of humility where you fall on your face and you worship when you recognize that there is someone who loves you enough to give his life for you. There is giving everything you have, giving your time and your talents and your energy, just like the Magi do, giving their frankincense and their gold and their myrrh, offering everything up to Jesus Christ. And finally, there is, there is a change in attitude where you start to obey God rather than men. These wise men, they no longer look to Herod. They're not influenced by him and by what, by what he wants, but they're ultimately influenced by, by God and but what he wants. And so our prayer today as we wrap up, our prayer is that you just would experience the joy of Jesus Christ, that you would experience the joy of Christmas, and that you would see Jesus Christ today for who he is. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. There's no greater gift that we could celebrate at this time of year Lord, you've given us everything that we need. We're blessed in so many ways. We have so many things that we don't need. They're, they're amazing things. We experience privileges. We experience good things. Lord, we, we often have more than we need. We have food on the table. We have friends that we can sometimes celebrate with. Lord, you treat us with such grace and with such kindness. But the thing that truly brings us joy at this time of year is Jesus Christ. Lord, something that, that brings such significance to our lives. The fact that we know in this cold and, and hard world where we do experience a lot of hardship, that there's always that ray of hope. There's that ray of hope that, that we celebrate as entering the world here at Christmas. And Lord, we pray that many would be moved to love Jesus Christ that they wouldn't deny him, that they wouldn't be hostile towards him, but that they, they would understand that he is a king that loves and that shows grace and that shows compassion and mercy. And Father, to experience that grace and that compassion is worth giving up everything. It's worth giving up everything for. And so we pray that you would lead us, that you would be that star before us. Also, as we look ahead to the next year, that we would see Jesus Christ before us, that by your Spirit you would guide us so that more and more we walk towards him, more and more that we follow, more and more that we experience the beauty that you offer. Father, we pray that you would hear this in your Son's name. Amen.